hillbilly, so I still can't read or write very good. And uh, that's nothing toward hillbillies, that's just me. I'm actually a hillbilly that is in Texas, so now I'm a half hillbilly, half redneck. So anyway, uh, but as I begin to think about where we are in, in the shift of things, we are not really in a paradigm shift. We're really in a paradigm shadow. And I thought about the title of this conference is Forsaking the History and Embracing the Mystery. And I thought to myself, when I heard it the first time, Kathy showed it to me on Facebook, I smiled. I said, well, this is awesome. This is cool. But then I thought, how does this sound to somebody that maybe has not caught up or listened to the CDs? How does this sound? And how did it sound to me maybe a few years ago? And so I got to thinking, you know, our human conditioning is that we don't let go of anything until we get something else. You know, our animal instinct is, I'm not letting go of this until I get this. So I thought, well, how did I come to this place? I mean, where I am right now, how did I get here? And I started looking at my wife, and the first one is, number one, a divine intrusion of awakening love. When I was a young man... A young boy, and I did not know who this preacher was. I did not know where I was. My memory, as far as biologically, has not formed. I went forward and I experienced an awakening love. Not unconditional love, but a love that has never, ever been conditioned. And from that day forward, I knew there was a love that was beyond any comprehension. Now, that created a knowing in me. The problem is, is that when you think you know there is a love and you can't experience it, you create belief systems. But you see, I didn't go to church. I didn't listen to King Jimmy every Sunday. So I thought, well, I don't even have a belief system. But I grew up in America, so actually I did. And I went through years. I'm married. I went to my uncle, who was the son of God. And I went to my dad, you know, I'm Pentecost. And I said, what do we believe? He said, we're Southern Baptists, but we got filled with the Holy Spirit. So we're <coughs> the Pentecostal Baptists. We're really just Southern Baptists, but nobody really don't have a place for us, so we're assembly God, you know, they were every label you could think of because they couldn't fit anywhere. I said, well, I'm divine by my experience, so I guess I'm all about love. But never experienced it. And then at 14 years old, this love returns, and now I'm thinking I'm called to ministry. So two things have to happen. One, i got to go to church. Number two, got to deal with this book. And that's where my love and relationship began with this book. Now, Lynn has a statement at his conference that says, right above his place, that says, if to think out of the box, you've got to think like there's no box. Well, see, I had created a belief system, a box, that I didn't even know I created. And I went to church, and they started reading to me out of translations. Listen, it didn't get me out of the box, but it sure rattled my box. Because when you go to Walmart and you buy a bookshelf, it'll have multiple languages. If you look at those languages, they'll still build a bookshelf. You go to church and you hear multiple languages out of a book called the Bible, and you're going to have clear confusion. <laughs> and I said, how come these guys in the 18th century translated things the way they did, and we have people today who are professors <coughs> or scholars who translate things that ain't nothing but a bunch of crap? Amen. And that's where they get their crap jerk. <laughs> so, most of you know this in this room, that you have divine intrusion that leads to divine interaction, that leads to divine fusion, then transmutation, and then you have to transformation. All of these words. Then you have the second level, and this is what took me years to learn, that Hebrew is not a language. Because for years, I'm studying words. I'm studying historical concept. I'm trying to study the history of the words, and it was not enough just to read translations. I had a ton of them. Still do. Mike has more than I do. Just <laughs> translation after translation. I started doing word study. I was a word study nut. I mean, I wanted to break everything down. And then it kind of got where everything I wanted to break down. I mean, everything I read in English, I wanted to break it down. But then I started studying Greek. And Greek's philosophical. It's questions. And I tore Russell or Arkansas up with questions. Questions, questions, questions. But I still wasn't out of the box. But then in 2005, I was driving along and this pastor got on there and he said, God is not an evil, wrathful God and you can find this if you find it in the Hebrew. It's in the beginning of the Young's Concordance. 
And I had listened to this guy for years on the radio. I had read Hagen's books that he got it from. And I called him up and I said, prove it. Well, when he went to prove it, guess what? He couldn't prove any of it. Because he said it was in the front of the Young's Concordance. Go buy a brand new Young's Concordance. There's nothing in the beginning of the Young's Concordance. Which means I had to do my research and find out that the further you go back, the older the Young's is, the more stuff's in the beginning of it. Because Young's Concordance, Dr. Robert Young did not fit any religious box. They gave him a Hebrew chair in Scotland, and he left because he kept getting into it with people. He was a linguistic because he was a typesetter. He was a printing press, and he taught himself Greek, Hebrew, Syriac, and Aramaic by doing printing press. He did the theological books that went to the University of Edinburgh. But all that aside, I began to read this, and I said, how can you tell people? I, I emailed Charles Capps, and they told me it was in the front of the young I emailed all these people, and I said, I'll tell you what. I made a meeting with them, and I said, you may not know what this is, but I'll find it. And I kept searching and digging. And I was cool in Arkansas with my Hebrew. Then I moved to Dallas. Hebrew roots split into about 50 different directions. I said, these people are crazy. Because <coughs> some of them don't even believe in a historical Jesus. And I said, this is crazy. And I put it aside. And then in 2009, I met Barbara. She introduced me to Lynn. And when I saw Lynn's and Lynn's CD, it's like this fountain just exploded on the inside of me. And there was an awakening. It was me learning a language. It was me understanding that this is symbolism. This is formalism of energy. And we've turned it into a language and a religion like we have all the other ancient things like hieroglyphs and Sanskrit. So this was number two. Right on my box, I had to repair it a little bit. Had to get some charismatic people to come over and pray it back up. <laughs> <laughs> then I got into the mystery of time. Now here is where the problems start. 2005. Because now, here's your main words in Greek for time. Kronos, okay? This, go any charismatic Greek scholar and say, what is Kronos? And that dummy will tell you it's the clock on your watch. But if you notice something, I don't have a watch. I usually teach it. Yeah, they left our watches at the house. And we're having a deal on a time. <laughs> She's in the flow. So, Kronos. <coughs> point to a watch. I say baloney. They'll say Kronos is the Greek word that's used for the time that we refer to as illusion. I say baloney. Did you know the ancient world had four calendars? And when I began to study this, I realized that this word right here, where did the Jewish people get their timetables from the Old Testament sacrifice. God gave them appointed feasts. He gave them appointed times. He gave them the uh, seven feasts of Israel. That was the Jewish people's chronos. And where do you think they got that from? This. So chronos is not the grand clock in the sky, as uh, C. Peter Wagner says. The chronos is the cycle of the zodiac. So now we have Greek scholars translating that this is this physical time and it has nothing to do with it. It's this cycle right here. Then you have this word, which is the word karos, which is the Greek word for your present moment. It's a gateway. It's the Greek word for karos. And I learned something years ago, and it's a book somewhere right here, called James Barr, The Biblical Words for Time. In the 1998, they built a thing called Graham Cord, and they took all the Greek and Hebrew that they knew, and they built a computer that would do it. They popped the words for time in, and it spit out and said, your definition's incorrect. They said, what? And they put it back in there. What they had designed, come up with something else. <coughs> One of them was that the word aeonian, which is this word here, we mistranslate as forever. Do you know that's why the Message Bible didn't have verses? Our chapters in it because we have versatitis. We study verses, we study words by verses, not by text. Which is the most idiotic thing I ever heard of in my life. And so I studied that word, it was in this verse. But what did the rest of the text say? That's why it was removed from the message Bible, and now the publishers have put it back in there. So then you have Taros. So this is your present moment. This is the cycle of the zodiac, and this is the word for age. And then I found something out in Hebrew that really messed it up because this word olam in Hebrew don't even mean anything. With time, it means outside of it. <coughs> now, these translators translate this, 
put all these things together and create dispensationalism, and most of your scholars are just regurgitating, and then we turn around and we open this book up and we got a timestamp on every verse in this book. I used to teach it. No, that's not for now, that's for later. No, that's not then, that's for this dispensation. No, that's for Israel, that's not for you. And when I started seeing this about time, it completely removed the historical. Now, people come up to me all the time and they say, Mark, what is the question? Is God sovereign or does man have free will? I learned a real powerful thing years ago. I learned to just say, yes. <laughs> but Richard Rohr talks about this word, paradox. Paradox is that when you're in a place of contemplation and you don't judge good or evil because it is what it is. So people always ask me, Mark, is it historical or is it revelation? And if I know where their consciousness is, I'll say, it's a paradox. You know why we don't like paradox? Because in our society, we think we have to have a belief system, and paradox means this is outside of my belief system, but I'm still open. But in reality, what we really understand <coughs> is most of what we come up with in this Bible comes from two things, time and our weak perception of it, and law. Go to people who say, oh, I'm under grace, and ask them what their definition of law is. Now, when I travel, I travel in all groups, okay? And when I would travel, I had people at church in one hour. I had people at church in three hours. Every conversation was, they all said the same thing, so we got them on, and then they said, what's your view of the law? This was a question that I asked in 1984 that I got to ride the churches for. Why are people asking these questions? And the question I told them was, David said, how I love thy law. I grew up a Baptist coastal law, and I hate the thing. That's how I think it's the biggest load of crap ever written in the Bible. <coughs> but now I'm seeing that people are beginning to ask questions, and when you go to Psalms, actually let's read that verse, Psalms chapter 19, <coughs> Psalms chapter 19. By the way, this is some of my research and some of mine's. <laughs> we read this verse all the time. Psalms 19.1 says, The heavens are declaring the glory of God, and their expanses are the glory, declaring the work of His hands. Now, how many times have you heard Lynn quote that verse? Many. But then you come down to this verse, and it says, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul, and the testimony of the Lord making wise, and the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. I read this years ago, and I said, that cannot be in there. Don't you put my law in my zodiac. And then I read it. And I was reading this one day, and Mike was studying in BibleHub.com, which actually includes the grammar, and they put this Hebrew word up here, which rocked my world. It's this Hebrew word, Mem, which is the Hebrew word for water, Samach, S-A-M-A-C-H. This is the Hebrew word for joy. But this means water. Do you know it's the only place that's found in Hebrew in the entire Bible? This word is never put in it but this place, which tells me this is not the law of Moses. This was not my Pentecostal law. This was the law of cosmology. Yes. Which tells me now I'm not living by the law of Moses. I'm living by metaphysical cosmology law, which we know nothing about because our law is full of contrast, good and evil. When we're talking about a law that is the cycle of the heavens. <laughs> and you should read this in there and make. And <coughs> Mike has a whole thing on his website about it. So when I started putting this together, this word here is the word joy. Well, I don't know about you, but what I heard about law growing up did not bring me joy. There's other words that you can hear in Georgia for that. <laughs> here too. Now, I'm not going to get into all this later, but the next one is evil is metaphor and symbolic. I spent years chasing an evil, and what happened was is that when I would come out of one message, I would make another message, which means I really never came out of the box. I just changed titles. So I used to chase demons. 
I taste every demon you can think of. I study demons. I thought one time this woman had a strawberry demon because she had strawberries all in her house. It was in her house, it was in her clothes, in her bathroom, and strawberries everywhere. I used to know women in deliverance. This is not I. Whatever I had a problem in, she laid hands on me and she didn't know what I had. I told her one time, I said, I got a, I said, I got a problem with uh, Christian rap. She didn't know what rap was, but she rebuked that Christian rap out of me. See, that is spirit in the name of Jesus. <laughs> but one day, I got rid of all my demons. Amen. I said, hallelujah. Amen. There's no, the devil's defeated. There is no. So then, I decided, well, okay, so the devil's Lucifer, so he's this being that runs around and buffets the suns, and I went that route, but I'm still in the box. Yeah. Yep. Then I decided, no, okay, there's not no uh, devil running around chasing, it's the call of mine, so then I decided, well, I'm going to ghost. And I went and tried to free all the ghosts. <coughs> Some ghosts don't want to be freed, or the people who are impaired all. Don't want to free my ghost, that's my money. <laughs> so then, then I said, and then, and then I said, I want the next level. And they said, well, the only thing left is aliens. And I said, I'm not going there. <laughs> they still sent me a bunch of books. I said, what? <laughs> you know, that was considered blasphemy. Now it's all you see on TV. I know. I said, I got thrown out of the church for talking about this. Man, I ain't even horns up now. It's all. Man, look at the movies. Have you ever seen that movie, Lucy? Yes. Oh my gosh. Man, I mean, if I was a pastor, that'd be Sunday morning. How about Interstellar? Yep. I spoke in tongues. We were in, you know, when they have the, what's it called, studio movie grill. Everybody's there like, what's this about? And he's talking about the fifth dimension. Now, oh, shot my glory to God. Look at the room. <laughs> so, this is where evil is Amen. symbolic and metaphoric. And listen, here's the thing that blew my mind. When I quit believing in the devil, all my manifestations stop. Every single one of them. But you know, it took me a long time to figure out the evil's energy. In fact, N.T. Wright made this statement in his book recently Simply Good News. Our problem is we've written thousands of books on the problem of evil, but never written on the problem of good. I said, hey, man, I've been preaching that for you. <laughs> How about Marcus Borg wrote in his book, Recent Confections, that even though the Bible is not factual or literally true, there's more truth in it than ever before. That's Marcus Borg. The world is waking up to the fact that what we've been seeing for years... <clears throat> Richard Rohr says Jesus didn't die for our sins. Jesus came to demonstrate we have the wrong idea of God. Yeah. Even the Course of Miracles says forgiveness is symbolic. Yeah. Yeah. We read that for years and then tried to fit it in our, well, well, let's fit it in our historical paradigm. But you know, I'm going to tell you, I got tired. When, when I, I could never <coughs> say what I'm saying about history until I dealt with this thing. And this thing led me to Hebrew and Syriac and Middle Eastern views because most of what we call law in America is politically based. In fact, most of church history is completely yes. based. Yes. Yes. Now, what's weird is when you quit being about belief systems, how many times your belief system changed? A lot, didn't it? Now I'm sitting there saying, okay, I don't believe in history. I'm watching the History Channel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching the Discovery Channel. <laughs> Hebrew and I said, like, man, my Pentecostal church never told me about that. <laughs> Hebrew that's, is, is found in archaeological sites in America that we say historically shouldn't be there. <coughs> I had friends of mine that jumped the fence and went and took a picture of it. I said, well, let me translate that thing. Let Lynn in there. I guarantee you don't say nothing about no God no box. <laughs> but when that began to happen, then I really came out of the box. And then I said to myself, which you said this morning, how did I ever fit in that thing? I'm a multi-dimensional being. Yes, right. And I'm doing some study right now of some unity pastors that in the 1970s began to research and go from Hebrew words to Egyptian and Sanskrit words, and they put out a metaphysical dictionary. It was self-published, and one of them got connected to Joe Goldsmith, and it is beautiful. And I'm thinking, this has been around for years. <coughs> it really has. But most of what we're looking for, I went to Barnes & Noble, and I said, okay, I have a problem. They said, okay, 
I said, I need an Egyptian hieroglyphic dictionary. And I don't want the person that pats everybody on the back and makes it sound like they're believing rapture. I want the guy that pisses everybody off. I said, because my Hebrew Greek scholars always made the fundamental people mad. I said, number two, I need it brought down in Duck Dynasty language, you know, where I can understand it. And I said, and number three, I said, more than likely, I wanted to, some guy that's really radical. See, my problem with comparative religion is we're trying to get all these religions to succumb to a religious view. When we understand what we're seeing, we understand all those books are not ancient. They are living, they are now, and we have made them into religious books, and they deal with the same thing we do. About six or seven months ago, a Muslim tried to convert me in a parking lot. I guess because of the car. Because, you know, I have all these symbols on my car. And he's sitting out there. And his first question is, do you go to church? And I said, oh, my God. I thought he was a Christian. I said, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I guess because I love McDonald's, not me, I'm a burger. You know, I'm going on this. And he looks at me and he goes, on someone, and he, he quotes Aramaic. He says it in English. I said, what do you quote? The Quran. He said, we're not terrorists. We're not blah, blah, blah. And he explained all this, and I said, okay, that's fine. Can you give me a copy of the Quran? Yeah, yeah, I can get I said, no, I don't want the English one. I want the Aramaic version. He stepped back. I said, no, I said, I and so I went linguistically. I messed with him. And then I looked at him, and I said, look, you had me when you went to talk to me. And you said, this is about love. I said, now let me talk to you. And I prophesied. I said, you are a magnificent being. His religion went right out the window. Because he thought he was going to convert me when I told him verses out of his own Quran that he had never read. And I realized the same religious junk that we deal with with this King James is the same thing they do with their right. right. That is right. And we're trying to make them, this is why I hate comparative religion, because we study all the religions of the world, and we want that weak, fleshly, white Jesus that doesn't look like he's taking two weeks for the land. So, oh, look, it all is about that. They <laughs> said, man, I'm going to tell you, whatever historically you believe, it wasn't like that. In fact, most of the time, it's leading you to discover it. That's why I say it's so wild, because every time I say something's not historical, history changes, but I don't live by that. They're finding stuff right now. What if they found manuscripts? I really believe the Vatican Library, the, even the Exam Alexander, I believe is in existence. <coughs> and y'all be surprised where I'll tell you, I'll tell you why I think it, I think it's not over there. I think it's here somewhere, Barry. Y'all got me, I'll be on. Let me throw this verse at you. 1 Timothy, chapter 1. First Timothy, chapter 1. One of the most mistranslated verses in all the Bible. <coughs> First Timothy, chapter 1, verse 4. Nor to pay attention, this New American Standard, to miss... In endless geologies, but give rise to mere speculation than the furthering of the ministration of God, which is by faith. But the goal of instruction is love from pure heart and good conscience and sincere faith. That's one of the most butchered verses that it says. Because what it says is not to pay attention to myths. That's the Greek word mythos. People come and ask me, is there anything to the word? Well, if it doesn't mean it isn't real, why does Greek lexicons have 22 pages dedicated to mythos? It can't mean something. There's more about mythos than there is faith in Greek lexicons. Not to pay attention to myths. The Greek word mythos comes from the word to initiate. And that isn't my Greek. That's Dr. Sparl Zeliati's Greek. This is the Greek, his study Bible. And endless geologies. The word endless there is the Greek word that means the opposite of piercing through. In my opinion, myth should have been translated endless. It's not Aeonian, which is a timestamp, because there is no such thing as forever and ever and ever and ever in Greek. What you see here should be the endless myth and endless geologies that give rise to speculation. In other words, quit reading this and speculating about the endless myths and speculation and realize it's telling a story, and that story is the love of God. Do you know why a myth is endless? Because it doesn't exist in time. Half of the verses in your Old Testament 
You put a time stamp on and you think that's still the way it is. But most of those verses were in a generation or a cycle. Now here's the problem. We still think with a Greco-Roman mind. Hebrew thought is not linear, it's circle. Which means the more you come around to a circle, time compresses. This here is the age of Pisces and the age of Aquarius. This point right here is described in two words, both for the will of God, Philema and Balema. One is the divine design, and the other is process. And we are being processed, not because God's trying to tempt us or test us. We're being processed by what's coming out of our being, because soul affliction is not what we go through on the outside. It's what's going through on the inside. And when you really understand paradox, that's the proper translation to curse in this, because the paradox, the light on the inside of me, and the light on the inside of me, outside of me, is trying to connect, and is processing me. Amen. See, when I go to church, and they try to beat the hell out of me, I don't go through nothing, but I go with y'all, and I start feeling stuff, because ascension, part of my body's still in a rim that it doesn't belong. Amen. So yeah, I get real Pentecostal in these meetings. <laughs> Not the church, but it's like shout out that. <clears throat> but I get in here and something happens to me. We read half of the Old Testament. Don't lie with an animal. There's certain things people I ought to be told. <laughs> <laughs> because it's symbolic. Now, <laughs> this is the equinox, and this, this is the Greek word, karos. Now, years ago, James Barr noticed that when these Greek words, karos and chronos, are used separately, they have distinct meanings. When they're used in the same verses, as in the Septuagint, and in parts in the New Testament, they're interchangeable words. I said, how could that be? Yeah. How can you have two words that have two different meanings mean the same thing? Because this is Kairos, okay? And this whole cycle is Kronos. And they meet at the equinox. And this whole thing is Cosmos. Not, I'll write that word down, not hanging, not drinking and chewing and hanging with girls that do. That's what they told me it was. It's been mistranslated as well. But the Cosmos is the entire universe. And Kairos and Kronos is the point in which these cycles meet, and you have this whole cycle as it goes from age to age is Aeonian. And it's in here that all of these Greek words meet. When you go from the age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius, that's when you begin to feel the heat coming on because you're no longer living in history or mystery or good and evil. You're no longer in judgment. You're living in contemplation because you really don't know what's happening because you're processing what has never been processed. Good. And we build God into a box and call it time. When Interstellar, they asked the physicist, they said, what's your greatest fear? He said, my greatest fear is not death. My greatest fear is time. It's my greatest enemy. But when you read Genesis 1, man did it all. He fell up, not down. Hallelujah. We try to put a time stamp on every one of these verses, including Old Testament verses where we think God was mad about. No, it's a cycle. And when I begin to see this, this thing right here, the law, I begin to realize. How many people sent you a newsletter that says, I'm not under law, and then they spend the next four pages telling you how they're under the law? See, we, we, there's something here we're losing terminology. Yes, yes. And I've decided, I'm, you know, I'm not a creative designer. I'm going to create my own. I don't believe in creation or evolution. I believe in the one and the same. And in Hebrew thought, creation and evolution is one and the same. But we think with a Greco-Roman mind because we're trying to make this fit, this in uh, Western Greco-Roman view. Now, I love Greek. I studied Greek for years. But all of these Greek words are just different dimensions of something that is outside of time. And we're looking for the true gospel. And it is the message in the open display in the sky. Yes. And we have had hundreds and thousands of years built on an image. And whether you like it or you don't, I read a book called 
Who is Jesus by a guy named Leander Keck, who says, whether you realize it or not, most of what we talk about Jesus, we're talking about the symbol in our heads. What we've experienced, not the historical... Read what Germans <coughs> call the historical Jesus. It began in the 16th century and still going on. Even N.T. Wright says what we discuss the historical Jesus is not what we know, but what we argue about history. <laughs> history is going to blow our doors away. Because we still think in a Western mindset, and we want to take a historical Jesus and fit it into that paradigm, and it don't fit. But let's look at the narrative of Jesus. Let's look at the narrative of Jesus. He's walking down the road, and they're looking at him like he's going to liberate everything, right? Mm -hmm. And a blind man walks up. No, notice what he says. Son of David, have mercy on me. Very seldom do you hear that. So he heals him. Did you know the Jewish people put blind men, they were, if they had a natural uh, defect, they would hire them in the Middle Eastern world to sit outside the temple because if you live by the law, you're give the law, and there's no poor how can you live the law? So the second he was healed, he was out of a job. And they said, oh, hallelujah, you're healing the people that's been oppressed. And then he turns around, walks down the road, and here's Zacchaeus over here. Now Zacchaeus can't walk into a crowd because to rabbis, the three worst things was a thief, a crook, and a tax collector. He'd have went in that crowd, he'd been killed. So he goes up to a tree. And Jesus not only does the most radical thing in the world, he talks to him, he goes and lives with him. The narrative of Jesus is a revolution of a person who does completely the opposite of what calls her actual. And that's the narrative. And we're trying to see, oh, what was his physical features? Listen, in Greek thought, this is the thing. What is it? What does it look like? How does it function? What is the colors of it? But in Hebrew thought, what is its function? In the Hebrew verbs, you would look at this pen and say, what does it say? What does it write? But in Greek thought, we went, well, that's color. It's pretty blue. It's expo. So when you read the story of Jesus in Hebrew thought, it's a verb. In Latin, it's not a noun. It's a verb. What did he do? What was his function? I'm trying to find out what the origins are and know all the history and know what I am because Christ is a verb. Love is a verb. And we are seeing the very judgment that we have created processing us because when we step out of ourselves, I'm not a non-judgment, and we step right back into it because we don't even see and understand mercy. Yes. Yes. Mercy in Hebrew was not that God was so far off. He looked right down, looked you right in the eye, and he said, I love you. I see every part, and I still love you. Non-judgment will never ever conquer anything until we understand how connected our good and evil paradigms are to it. And I am seeing this not in manifestation in theology, but in my life. Because it blows my mind how that I can sit at a person that I pick up on my trash truck and think, he's homeless, he don't have no money. This guy doesn't have a dime to his name. And then he gets in my trash truck and I think, boy, I'm going to minister to him. I'm going to reach out to him. I'm going to talk to him. And he's there for me and my ego-driven religious self. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And listen, these guys are mathematicians. They're some of the smartest people I ever lived. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm going to do them a favor. And I live in that every single day. And then I drive to Conway, Arkansas. I've told this story a hundred times. I drive up, I pull up to a Starbucks, and there's a pretty woman sitting right over there. And every person in that place is looking, looking and gawking. And God says to me, go apologize to her for the way men treated her. I say, you got your own person, God. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I ain't even talking about judgment. I am profiler. I said, she looks like so-and-so. Is she an actress? You know how you think. And all of a sudden, my wife's up, my wife's up and she looks me right now and she goes, what did God tell you to do? And when I went to her and I told her, she said, you don't know how much of a hindrance that is. Because we think of, if a person looks like they have a <coughs> hair, 
but it's a hindrance. And when I walked over and I said to her, the day I said that to her, God's mercy said, mercy is not a superior reaching to an inferior. It's when you look someone in the eye and say, we are equal. I walk in forgiveness, not because I don't see you below me. I see really who you are. Amen. That's biblical forgiveness. Yeah. That's biblical. Not because I have pity. Not because I feel emotion. But because I see in you that which is the oneness that we are. Yes. And it gets really struggled sometimes in three-dimensional because... There's even things that tug at my heart now. Oh, I want to reach out. I want to do something. And I get involved and I make a mess out of things. Put me on a committee to reach out to people and do evangelism and you'll have a mess. <laughs> I want to say to you that there is a perspective that you have that is so important to this team. And you say, I don't do this and I do this, but you do something that is so beautiful. I, Part of me is a translator. That's what I do. I go off the corner and translate. I know Lynn is a translator. You're a translator. You translate so many things that is in part of the prophetic flow that we don't have the language for. But when I listen to you today, I say you are a paraphraser. You take things that are these nuggets and you talk about how it is. The wiring, when I listen to you, my wiring gets undone. Because I thought, boy, that is so stupid. And I've done that. And then you say something and it connects. You're a paraphraser. And you are a vital part of this team. And God spoke to me a few months ago about this team, about you and you and you. And he said, the reason that this is so powerful is y'all are not trying to do a belief system or even be like one another. You're being the being of who you are. Amen. Man, when you share a law and grace, something goes on inside me because I realize most of what we know about law is the image that we have of law, not what it is. Yeah. And so I thank you for your beingness and celebration. And listen. Don't ever apologize for who you are because it is the part of the blend. And I come up here and, you know, uh, I'm like a sushi sieve. I just throw stuff everywhere. <laughs> but I thank God. Don't even like that word, but you know. I, I did that for years. I prayed. So I said, God, I said, thank it. Thank it. Thank it. Do you say, thank it? No, thank it. Because they're mad. God's not Melvina. They threw me out. And they said, you and your it can go. <laughs> and they, they got real creative and said other words. <laughs> but is this all hidden in language for a reason? Yes. Because we're just seeing that this Bible, this Bible is your story. Yes. And if you really want to know his story, <coughs> it's not in here. It's up there. But the more you understand this, the more you see your story. Because if you have one without the other, it becomes imbalanced. It's one. And I find so many times, people ask me, do you believe it's historical? Or do you believe it's mystery? I say yes, because I'm in paradox. <coughs> but when I get amongst people, I tell them, listen, I've studied words for years. In the last three years, my theology, my revelations... My understanding has took a quantum leap because I saw this in the 80s because of language. We saw stuff in linguistics that didn't make any sense. How could Greek have Sanskrit roots? How could Hebrew come from ancient Hebrew? How can Hebrew come from Egyptian? Our lexicons told us that. But we couldn't make the connections, and so we ran around and preached. Well, I didn't. I didn't preach on hell. I knew from the beginning it was... I'll just, I told him one thing. I said, why are we always talking about what was in the unseen realm? Well, I don't even understand who I am. I'm not trying to figure out what I do after death. The Egyptian book of the dead ain't about what I have after death. And half of what you know of the law that's in your King James Bible came from ancient books about the law. Even the Emerald Tablets. They didn't look at the law as a negative thing. <coughs> Which tells me Egyptian law is liberating, is more sound, all the whole... Sanskrit language turned to sound, but what we're talking about is a law that was created when we turned Hebrew into a language. And this is all the ancient languages come when they would look at the stars and look at the zodiacs and create symbols, and then people come around and turn it into a language. And we say, ooh, look at what they did. No, it's the worst thing that ever happened to us. Because from that day forward, you and I cannot communicate one to another, we had to start talking to people in language of boxes and concepts, and now there's something between me and you, and then we don't know how it got there. I'm fixing to 
takes the class. In all of my years of studying this stuff, there was a woman, the most powerful woman I knew in the Holy Spirit. I mean, this woman was awesome, man. And she came in there one day, and she was in the Assemblies of God. <coughs> and I stood up and I said, the Lord gave her a prophetic word. Her person that was with the Assemblies right beside her, and I told her, I said, your day in the Assemblies are done, leave. And that pastor said, you can't prophesy stuff like that. And I said, I just did. <laughs> and she come back about a year and a half later. We had not seen her. She come up to me, and the first thing she did was she looked me in my eyes, and she talked to me. I said, this is where I heard her voice. And she had gold shoes, and I said, look, you're rooted in the divine nature. She said, you better believe I am. She answered me from that day forward. Now, was it so big that I prophesied? No, when I ministered to her in the prophetic, we reached a place where we don't have to talk with words. Amen. Listen, this is going to get interesting. All of your ancient languages are turned to sound. Amen. That's why I was so impressed when I heard Lynn's Hebrew. Even my Hebrew is not like his because I could tell it was coming out of his belly. It wasn't just, oh, here we go. Let's read this word. Now listen, Strong's Concordance, he tried to do a good thing to you know, open this up. But all he did was quote other people. He did not show you the power of these Hebrew letters. And every one of these Hebrew letters, it was the same pattern they're discovering in quantum physics. What science thinks they're just now discovering was going on in the 16 the 1800s. And many of your translators, there's a verse in the Moffats that refers to a part of your medical ear, the inner part of your ear, that he translated the word before medical science discovered. Mm -hmm. This is not. A historical book. It is a medical book. It is a book about you. It's an astrological book. <coughs> okay, don't go looking for the red blood moon tonight and think you're going to get a sign to Israel. I got news for you. There's four of them, and two of them Israel didn't even see. And everybody's going crazy. You know what I think it was? Because God wanted John Hagee to stand up and say, I have a 2,000 book library in my house, and I didn't have one book on biblical astronomy. That's sad. That's sad. You probably got 2,000 books on biblical astronomy, and then you got like two or three of them. <laughs> That's reversed for you. But you know the beauty of all of this is when I come here and I sit back and I listen to you and you and you and you and different ones, I'm back here translate. I'm back here translate. And while I go, I was looking at it and I said, Look, we have never pierced into what a myth is. If I have a definition of eternity, it's that myth is an eternity because it's a myth that exists throughout time. Right. It's a story. Amen. And the second you're given something historical, it's now all of a sudden put in time. And that's one of our biggest problems. We're reading a story in the Bible. Oh, how does that historically lay out? When you read the story about Santa Claus, you don't sit there and go, well, let's just dig this out. Who's this real guy? <laughs> <laughs> You don't look at it on a Coca-Cola bottle, and we do it every day, and don't think of it. But you get to a church, you know, Santa Claus is a myth. Mm -hmm. And then we, but people freak out when you get to the church and say, well, well so-and-so really wasn't a historical person. And I, I can guarantee you, the more we talk about this, the more history is going to change. The more manuscripts. I'm telling you, the manuscripts is nothing. You are the manuscript. Mm -hmm. But the more you discover you, how do we know they ain't going to stuff come start popping up? <coughs> They're going crazy right now. They may open up. Hey, y'all come on in here. Because they are understanding, every one of them, what mutilation we have done to people in the name of this Bible. Not Koran. Go to a mental institution. It's always the Bible. Never one person. The Koran, the Nagia, the Yoga Sutras. You know what it is? That sucker. Because it has been so warped. And the Yoga Sutras say in Sanskrit that the same energy and consciousness you've used for sin, now used for union. As in the Yoga Sutras. Well, I think I'm done. I just disconnect. But I want to thank you, and I'm honored to come here and share with you guys. And if I never speak, if I, never, if I just sit back here and translate, because when I'm in this room of energy, things become so clear. Yeah. And you know, that's the first... I've studied Greek for years. I went to David Holtzman, and I translated three pages... And they said, what are you doing? I said, I don't know. The dictionary in my head's going crazy. Because it was an energy. It's not words. If I talk for 15 minutes or two hours, it's the energy. Are you catching this? 
When she screamed this morning, it reminded me of that new song by Bethel where Jesus is my king and this young person, 17 years old, she goes, help me, Jesus! She wasn't singing, she wasn't playing, she was being real. And there's a cry that's being birthed today yes. that is that cry, it is that Lazarus come forth. And it's showing up everywhere. Oh, that was an awesome praise and worship song. She wasn't even paying attention to you. I know, I watched the video. As soon as the song went, she kept crying. Why? Because they know the truth is inside of them. It's in the movies, it's in the theaters, and the stuff that we've heard all of our lives that is in the movies and in the theaters is the very stuff in church that don't, don't have nothing to do with. It. The paranormal. Man, I said, boy, you know, all I'd have to do is turn around and say all this stuff is a lie and write a book on demons and I'd have a bestseller. Because the world is going nuts over the paranormal. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to somebody one day and I said, you know, if you get far into that and you look further enough into it, you can prove anything you want to find. Because let me tell you, our problem is not evil. It's our paradigm of good. Because when I have a paradigm of good, I size every one of you up and judge you based on that. And that is our main problem. Thank y'all. I don't know where to put it. A short interview again, um, really nice, dovetailing into what Lynn was talking about. We're learning about these aspects of ourselves that were split um, with the advent of duality, which is masculine and feminine, men and women, male and female. Um, but really, I, I posted something on Facebook the other day, there's just always such heated debate over homosexuality and same-sex marriage. And my comment was this. That if you find yourself arguing about somebody, somebody's sexuality, and if you are condemning them for being a homosexual or a same-sex marriage, then it's very, a very clear indicator of what age you are in. Because in the age to come, there is neither male nor female, and neither men are taken. That is very good. Amen. Isn't that good? Yes. And so. These issues, while they may be hot topics for those that are called to transition the age, these issues are not issues. I don't even know if all. But what is your stance on the issue? It's a non-issue. What is your stance on homosexuality? It's a non-issue. But how can you not take a stand on these things? I cannot take a stand on these things because I know what age I'm called to transition into. And in that age, these are not issues because there is no judgment between right or wrong, left or right, up or down, positive or negative, or even. It's just not there. So we're going somewhere. And in this place that I talked, you know, this morning when I talked about transitioning the age or going over the bridge or whatever, we do have our foot planted in this dispensation in this age in this realm we're transitioning over so we have not gone this way before so just like when they were going to take the promised land it said keep your eyes on the earth keep in step keep up the pace keep moving forward do what you know how to do today tomorrow that may change but don't look back just keep moving forward so with that in mind I want to before we start the video I love this. I have this on my Facebook page. I would like to apologize to anyone that I have not yet offended. <laughs> I will get to you shortly. <laughs> also, um, here's just a couple of, of, of cute little quotes. If you could kick the person in the pants responsible for most of your trouble, you wouldn't sit for a month. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All my life, I always wanted to be somebody. Now I see that I should have been more specific. <laughs> and this is from the late Robin Williams. If women ran the world, we wouldn't have wars. Just intense negotiations every 28 days. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, it was um, pretty long into our marriage, but I came to realize that there were these things that would happen about once every 28 days. And I would get so angry and so passionate about what it was that I was feeling, and my poor husband would just sit and shake his head. So I got to the point where, when it came around that time of the month, 
I did not make any critical decisions. <laughs> and if I was mad at anything or upset at anything, I would wait at least 24 hours before I said anything. But that, that was only like the last few years. No, so sorry, honey. <laughs> <laughs> This is um, excellent. Keep in mind now, she's going to say some things, and there may be a tendency to rise up a little bit because of the nature of what she's going to say. And you'll know when she says it. But it isn't about men and women. That's not what this is about. Uh, it's about learning that each one of us has a masculine and a feminine side. And you're male, you have a feminine side. You have a masculine side. If you're female, vice versa. And we're learning that these are um, principles of who we are. We have a masculine principle and a feminine principle. One is something that inspires thought and more like a seed giver, and the other one is a receptacle. And it's that way in nature. And these things happen to us in nature to express something that is unseen. So let's go ahead and watch this. I'll dim the lights and we'll talk. <coughs> There are worlds within worlds, systems within systems, patterns within patterns, all waiting to be noticed by the observant observer. The truth is, everything we encounter here is actually a representation of a higher truth. Everything. Sometimes these representations aren't a very good replica of these higher truths because we have distorted their reflection out of dusty or cracked mirrors. But that which is being reflected isn't really warped or distorted. It waits in its perfect wholeness, its perfect holiness, to be observed as it truly is. So today, I'd like to dust off those mirrors and look at one of these patterns within a pattern, one that is very familiar to each of us. Because when we begin to understand the nature of these patterns, these laws, this interplay, these cosmic dances, when we understand them on any level, then we can see it repeated on all levels. And this seeing clears away quite a bit of misconception. So on this video, I'd like to talk about what it means to be male and female. The true spiritual meaning behind the sexes, the yin and the yang the dance of the sexes. You may think you've heard it all before, but I guarantee you, this is a take on the birds and the bees that your mama never told you. Male and female aren't simply physical genders. They are actually expressions of a deeper truth, a pattern that repeats over and over. It's a beautiful interplay that permeates our very world on every level imaginable, as I hope you'll soon see. <coughs> now, whether you're a woman or a man, there's no doubt that you've had to notice there's a constant reference to male preference and male dominance that is upheld by virtually every religion and culture imaginable. It's even part of the sacred text. But it is the truth being seen thinly, superficially, through dusty and fragmented mirrors. And as you have begun to understand, the higher truths are very much like magic eye pictures. At first, we I think we might see something there, maybe something in that jumble of colors, and maybe we convince ourselves that we do, but all we are really seeing is our own prejudiced projections. That is, until the day when we suddenly really see it, when we suddenly really get it, and to our surprise we see in a depth never imagined before. Now, as a female, I always knew something had to be up with this male preference thingy, no pun intended. I mean, who could take serious an almighty being who prefers one over another based upon whether they wear panties or boxers? I mean, really, doesn't that sound just a little silly? Just a tad shallow? But it's easy to see how historically male leaders had always assumed this superficial interpretation if for no other reason than it worked out quite nicely for them in many cases. And really, I can't say that I blame them. But my spirit, 
which knows no physical gender, just could never buy into it. I always knew there was more to this male-female business than met the eye, but at the time, I just didn't know what. So I wrestled with this for years until finally I quit trying to rationalize it or think my way around it. I finally did what I tell you to do. I asked why. The answer came like a bolt out of the blue. I always refer to answers like this as being downloaded to because that's what they feel like. Bam! This complete explanation suddenly appears where before there seemed to be not a clue. And this is what I learned. Male and female are, big surprise, two parts of the whole, like the yin and yang. The male <coughs> is the catalyst, the seed, the direction, the intent. It is less subtle than the female and easier to see what it's doing, and it seems to dominate, but it really doesn't, because it cannot bring what it wills into being without the female. Now the female is the medium, the field to be planted. It is that which has the ability to bring forth and to nurture and to sustain what it brings forth. It is the more subtle of the two, often mistaken as weaker, but it's not. It is the divine medium from which all is made. Or a simpler way to look at it is this. The male is the recipe and the female is the ingredients. And it takes both to bake a successful cake. And each of us have both of these within us. Whether you are a woman or a man or a special someone in between. We do. So, what is this higher truth about it being preferable to be a male? Why is it that way? Because if you are male, you are the one casting your seed, your intent, your will. You are the directive. You're the recipe. And this maleness is within each of us, regardless to our gender. To be female means to be receptive, to be the field, to be the medium that brings forth, and that's good. <coughs> And we each have this as well. But to be only female means you have brought forth no directive, no intent, no say so on what comes forth. And that's not good. Now, if somebody comes by and plants good seeds in your field, good for you. You'll benefit from it. In fact, I am casting my seed into you right now to see if it finds root. But what happens if you get bad seed? You get a field full of things you didn't want. But when you have become male, spiritually, you are casting your seed into the world, impregnating others with the truth, planting good harvests in untended fields that the owners of the field will eventually benefit from. You can cause spiritual quickening in those who are awakening and wish to bring forth. This is the spiritual meaning behind being male and why it is indeed preferable. The higher truth is being male is not about a chromosome preference from a misogynistic God. Being male is all about this. And as you are relearning how to look on your bottom shelf as we talked about in Astonished and see what is there and replace it with what you want to see, you are exercising this maleness, your directive, your intent. And when you don't do this, you are like the empty field that just lets things pile up there and you get whatever shows up, whatever the wind blows in, whatever <coughs> another plants there, whether you want any of these things or not. And when we begin to see like this, when the scales fall away from our eyes, we see the truth as it was meant to be seen. We can see that it is preferable to be male, to cast your own seed, sow your own fields. It makes perfect sense because you direct what will grow in your life and you call it forth. So let us mature and go forth so that we may cast good seed into the untended gardens of sleepy brothers and sisters that they may awaken and eat of what has been planted and grow and become mature males themselves. 
because this is what it really means. This is the higher truth being expressed. So, mature. Cast your seed and begin replanting paradise, your garden of Eden, today. Because when one rises, we all rise. You have this ability to do this and more.
one of the things that one of my jobs right, is I cut the grass. Well, I'm riding along where we've got a few acres around the house there, and I can remember just it, it's my it's my Zen time, and sometimes I need to be a little bit more vigilant with my my Zen time. And so as I'm driving around, I was thinking about all of these experiences and just crying, just crying at the loss of friends and relationship. And um, interestingly enough, that evening I was uh, called by one of these friends. And um, she said, look, my air conditioning went out and we're all sitting here uh, having a get together and uh, our friend is in from out of town and she really wants to see you. And you know, my heart just left. <coughs> oh, they're thinking of me and I'm worthy enough for someone to come back to my home. and." And um, anyway, long story short, they never showed up. They got pretty loud, and and I got the house ready and straightened up the, the bedroom where they'd be, and of course, swished out the toilet and washed the sink, and Lyle sat up with me until midnight, and they never showed up. And so what that did was gave me another opportunity, and I finished cutting the grass the next day, and I was out there, and I'm just boo-booing. And this voice comes to me and says, you are a marvelous creator of your own reality. Just look what you've done within 24 hours. Look what you've done. And so, again, just encouraging you, tend to your garden. And try little things, even just little tiny baby steps of things that you want to create, recognizing that you have got a seed giver, the one that provides the recipe, and you have the one that has the ingredients. And you can begin to create whatever it is that you want in your reality. It's easy. And we've been doing it all this time. Except we've had such a large expanse of time between our conscious, our unconscious thought and emotional equivalent being you know, thrown toward an example and its ultimate manifestation. I said that really clumsily. There has been a lot of time between our thought and its ultimate manifestation. And right now, that time is shrimping. Shrink, shrimping. It's shrimping. It's shrimping. It's shrinking. And you'll notice that. And it's very evident to me that things that, I mean, they're just happening quickly. Remember my story about the black gums? I mean, I'm still blown away by that. I'm just blown away by that. So any questions about the process of creation with masculine and feminine energies? Okay. Well, that was it. We've got more tomorrow. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the Merkaba and the energy body and how that is created as well, which is a lot easier than what you think. And exciting. Okay, Mr. Lynn.
and that was uh, that was where I was. I just had a lot of energy. I was I was from a Baptist family. My grandfather was the like the pillar of the community. Owned a very very large farm that we lived on and worked. And so basically, what we knew and what we grew up with was just work. That's what we did. Everybody worked. So time we were we were able to uh, go pick cotton. Five six year old. Then we stayed out of school and went pick cotton because that's just what we did then. And uh, so that's how I grew up. I grew up on that. I, I told you that to say. I would never dream that I would have a pile of books, especially a book as big or thick as that, in my hand. <laughs> Simply because I had no desire to read, I had no desire to study, and uh, and I did, I did. So I did have an ability to retain the information. So the only information that I would have for tests or whatever was just what I happened to hear if I happened to be in that class. I would hear it and retain it sometimes enough to pass a test. So my average grades were between <coughs> F minus and a D plus. <laughs> and I thought that was a pretty good report for me. So, so anyway, then my world was changed. And as I told you or shared with you this afternoon, my world was changed by an experience. And then from that experience, I, uh, I I did not quit smoking at that time. I had smoked for a long time. We, matter of fact, we would sneak and smoke when I was seven, eight year old. I had bigger brothers, so my bigger brothers, when I was six, seven, eight year old, they would put me up going into the little country store and stealing cigarettes for them. So, so I learned to steal early. I mean, real little because of the big brother influence. So uh, that. Uh, that was just, that was a part of my life. So we started smoking, and we would, I mean, you know, we were eight, nine, ten-year-old kids. I was, my big brother, he was four or five years older than me. And so I run around following him and doing what he, he put me up to doing my meanness, or he thought it was for him, you know, I was just doing stuff for him. So, uh, we would go out and smoke, and then we would chew pine straw, you can chew green pine, <coughs> and mom and daddy can't tell you to smoke because it kills the smell. That's for you that didn't know that. Keep each one. Keep <laughs> so anyway, when uh, I I uh, had our experience, Connie and I had our experience in the motel. We had our experience as a result of a crash in my life. My life had my childhood theft of cigarettes and stealing from my big brother had grown up into an adult thing which I was a part of a motorcycle gang and we were stealing cars and motorcycles and so I thought I was going to have to go to prison. So at 26 my world come down I thought I was going to have to go to prison and uh, I was in a motel to try to get my life in order because I wasn't interested in going into prison with a bunch of men and uh, I wasn't interested in being with men. So we went to a motel to just get help, and we did. We did. Like I said, I come up from the side of the bed in an earnest prayer, God, I need help. I'm going to have to go to prison, and I need help with all the things that will happen. So at that point, I had, and, and just for some reason, a hunger dropped in me to read this book. I had never read this book. I had never uh, been interested in the in the book called the Bible. No, I take that back. I did have an interest in it at one time in my early early childhood, eight, nine, ten. I had a, an interest in church because there was one across the street, and I walked over there, and it was just something about what they did that interested me, and so I got excited about it. I didn't read the material. But uh, I just was excited about what they were doing. And so I would sit there and try to write down what the preacher was saying at that age. And that only lasted for a few years and then, then that left. But then when 
this experience happened with Connie and me, I had such a hunger and my world turned around. The grace of God worked and mercy began to lean my way and uh, I couldn't stop reading this book. And so after about three years of studying, I would study this the Bible. I would study anywhere from 10 to 16 hours a day without stop. It just it was insane. <coughs> I couldn't quit. And so then my family got concerned about me the other way. And my dad, he said, we are really glad that you have God in your life and that things have changed for you. But you're reading the Bible too much. A lot of people go crazy reading the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> back to what Mark was talking about. And so I told my dad, I said, Daddy, if this is crazy, that I enjoy it. And I'm going to keep doing it. And so that has been approximately 40 years ago. And I have not broken that <coughs> yet. I'm still addicted. So now that it has gone into books, I do have a very extensive library, and I have another one at the church that I don't ever, and I have an office in church, but I don't ever go in that office. I haven't been in that office other than to go in to, to counsel with a couple to get married or to go in, uh, you know, there's dust everywhere in there because I don't hardly ever go in there, and I have a, probably a library there of four, five, six, eight hundred books. But they were charismania books and they're just still there. So I don't ever uh, read that material. I wish I had the edition of Hal Lindsey's book that he wrote in 70, 72, 3, 4, Late Great Planet Earth, which he prophesied and predicted the end of the world, the return of Jesus. Somewhere I think it was in the 80s. Then he revamped that book. Now, I'm not even sure you can get that book. And then I thought, well, if we could, if we could accept the things that we say that we accept that when some so-called prophet prophesies something and it don't happen, generally what they would call that person is a false prophet. And normally if that happens when the false prophet begins to speak, people don't listen. And it's completely amazing to me that he still has a tremendously large audience and they're still moving that same event. What did you call it, Mark? Rapture. No, you didn't call it rapture, you called it rapture. Rapture. Crapture. <laughs> so I'm not really even sure where the crapture world is at at this stage because I'm disassociated or disconnected from TV ministry. We don't watch television other than we... I love y'all that listen to my monthly CDs. You know that I'm a movie buff. I love to watch movies because I get so much out of movies. I get yes. things out of movies that you, most people say, oh, that's too wicked or too corrupt or too much fighting or too much sex or this or that. And I'm sitting here and I'm just getting all kinds of tremendous stuff. I say, well, I think God's the one who wrote this movie. <laughs> you, know? you know, Cloud Atlas says, I mean, how many of you seen that one? Golly, bum, there's so many phenomenal movies that have come forth. To me, I just enjoy extracting out of those those bits of material. So I, I think that when we go back and we understand what some of the, uh, who was it that had a picture of the Colosseum? Amos did. We would go back and understand that those Colosseums were not built to parade men or women out to fight lions and people come there bloodthirsty to watch these people have their heads pulled off by a hungry lion. If we would wake up and go back and do a little research and realize those phenomenal coliseums were built as theaters and plays and people went there to watch these phenomenal plays that were built in the and rooted in the mythos they were telling the story of the perennial philosophy. They were telling the story of the great work. And people, thousands, would flock to see these phenomenal plays and these great stories. We have had so much material thrown at us that's so corrupt and so twisted. And it's amazing to me that we still seem to stick our head in the sand and ignore what's really happening and ignore it the plain truth because it's just everywhere all around us. But we are waking up, aren't we? We are. We really are. We are waking up. And so I want to read something from the Anacalypsis. This is a, a 
book that was done, a tremendous work, a man who given, had given his life, spent 40 years, and this was a volume of book that he wrote, I think it was in 1834, 1836, somewhere around there. There's actually two volumes to this particular book. And I want to read you something that he wrote. This was in 1830-something. He said, After giving the subject all the consideration in my power and a diligent examination of ancient documents for many years, I have become convinced that all of the ancient histories are written <coughs> for the sole purpose of recording the mythos. See, hear it again. And this is this is not something this man wrote lightly. He had given his entire life. Matter of fact, he didn't write this book until he was in his late seventies. And again, listen to this. After giving the subject all the consideration in my power and a diligent examination of ancient documents for many years, I have become convinced that all of the ancient histories were written for the sole purpose of recording the mythos. And again, I can't say it enough. I don't know how to say it. I, I continually seek for words and ways to communicate what the mythos is and what the mythos is about. The mythos is about a fabulous story that ignites the energy of God inside you that's already there, that's waiting just to be stirred up. Christianity has learned that in some ways through their service. They know how to stir you up. You can go into a Pentecostal service. They can get the, they got excellent musicians, don't they? They know how to work, and they work that. And I'm not saying that in this respect toward them. They know how to work that program. And it works. Do you know why? It stirs up inside you an emotion. That's one of the reasons that the, the misuse of Scripture at funerals are so powerful. Because you are at a high emotional state. Because you, you won't turn loose of something that God said you need to rejoice when they graduate and not boo-hoo and pitch a fit. But we have, through American Christianity, we've reversed everything. And I remember 28 years ago when I did my father's funeral, it, come, it just like a lightning bolt hit my mind. I began to realize what the books of Ecclesiastes was saying or what it was meaning when it said that when a child is born you should weep and cry but when someone dies you should have a party you should have fun you should sing and you should dance and you should have a feast we have it by sacraments yeah. but we're working on turning it back around and so when i did that my daddy died my first grandbaby was born so yeah i have a granddaughter 27 year old and I'm only 49, but uh, that's how I knew that. And I knew that because I knew my daddy had run his race. I knew that he had finished his course and he crossed over. And for that reason, I could rejoice. And then I had lived part of my life in a rough atmosphere. And I knew that my granddaughter could walk that path. And so I understood that scripture, what it meant. So, again, I want to read this to you. After giving the subject all the consideration in my power and a diligent examination of ancient documents for many years, I have become quite convinced that, that all of the ancient histories were written for the sole purpose of recording the mythos, which, which it was desired to transmit to posterity, but yet to conceal... <coughs> from all but the initiated. Jesus examples this for us. As a matter of fact, just take your Bible real quick. We flip over to Mark chapter 4. Let me uh, show you this so that you can see this. Jesus has been out on the sea, on the hillside. He's out speaking to a group, a large group, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. Large group of people. He's using a parable 
parable is a symbolic illustration to tell a spiritual truth. He's using a parable. Just he just laid it out, not doing anything other than just giving a parable. He's operating in a mythos. It's a story. And then in verse 10 of chapter 4, it says, And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. When he was alone. This Jesus is operating in the understanding of a sage that knew how to initiate new initiates into the mystery school. And the way that he did that was he spoke to the multitudes and the crowds and he spoke in, in a parable, but to those who come in the house or come into the room wanted to know more, he began to unveil. And here's what he said. I'll read it again, verse 10. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery... That's what this is about. Mystery versus history. The word, the Greek word for mystery is the word mysterion. And the word mysterion actually means that which is made known to you outside your ability to know a thing. See? So if it's outside your ability to know it, where does it come from? It comes from divine impartation. It comes from that which is already within you. That which is within you begins to resound and echo itself through you, to you. This is exactly what he's talking about. This is the mystery of the kingdom of God. He said, don't go looking for it because you won't find it. If you go to Jerusalem looking for it, it ain't there. If you go to the sea looking for it, it's not there. It's inside you. And that's the last place that we look. We don't, you know, we can't. We say it couldn't be inside Lynn. Lynn's too wild. He's too reckless. He's this. He's that. But the kingdom of God was always inside me. It's always been inside you. There's not anything you can do to exit or cause the kingdom to flee from you. Nothing. You can't do anything. Verse eleven. He said unto them, Unto you it is given to know. Gnosko. That's an intuitive thing. It's not a thing of accumulative knowledge. Now, I do accumulate a certain amount of knowledge by reading all of these books that I read. But that is not the knowledge that I need to speak to you out of. The knowledge that I need to speak to you out of is a knowledge that's gained to me in my contemplative, meditative, quiet moment. In that time when I'm sitting there and I'm watching the creek or the river or I'm sitting there watching the wind move the plants or I'm sitting there just in a state of non-being and I'm totally in that silent moment. And God speaks. You know what I'm saying? Those are moments that you and I need to learn to practice constantly. It's not something that you should do once a week or a month. We should set aside time on a daily basis that we would begin to contemplate, meditate, spend that time of being just alone, being quiet in silence. So let me read on a little bit further. He said, which it was desired to transmit to posterity, but yet it, to conceal it from all but the initiates. You see, God does desire, and God's design is that the whole earth be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. That is true. And that will happen as you and me awaken, not as we cram something down someone's throat or try to make them walk in my revelation, but as we live it in front of them and they begin to read our book and they begin to see, wow, they may have something that I would like to have. And then you become the living epistle. Up until that time, this book was nothing but a dead letter. And the sad thing is we have had the dead letter message shoved down our throat until people don't want to hear it no more. They don't even want to hardly read this book. But when you realize this is a book about the, the, the very person of who you are, this is about you. The story of Jonah is the story of you. The story of David facing the Nephilim is the story of you facing that giant that's in your mind that's a thought that says this cancer is going to kill you or this divorce will destroy you or, 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 or. That is the giant that you need to understand how to take the smooth stones that God's given you and slay that sucker. It's not some great big figure. 
even though that thought's a pretty big figure in it. Because you've had them, we've all had them, we all face them, we all have to deal with them. So the traditions of the countries, let me say something here to clarify this. <coughs> our, our conference is June, I actually meant that, and announced that at the beginning, I forgot. Our conference is in June, I think it's the weekend of June 5th, 6th and 7th. And uh, the theme of our conference is going to be the mysteries of godliness, which are built on this theme in which I will probably expound some on the Nephilim, not as a people that visit the earth from another planet, but as the very thought, which the word Nephilim actually means, gigantic thoughts, thoughts that begin to take over and destroy you, and that's from the Hebrew, breaking the Hebrew code down. And I said that to say this, I thoroughly enjoy the Will Talks. I don't know if any of you have ever read the Will Talks or you have uh, heard him on YouTube. I enjoy David Wilcox and I enjoy a lot of the things that he's bringing out. Even though to the probably to the religious mind, some of the things he brings out are pretty bizarre and far out, especially by aliens and the earth being visited by alien people from different different continent different worlds. I feel that that is probably very true. But if I take that idea and try to build it from the Hebrew Scripture with the Nephilim, I'm misusing that concept. And that's all I'm trying to say. I do feel that we have been visited and we are visited by alien beings. Okay? <laughs> Some of you think, man, I don't believe in nothing else out there. Oh, I do. There's plenty out there. You know, and they can be in all sizes, shapes, and colors, and everything. Let me read on a little bit. Further. The traditions of the countries were made subservient to this purpose without any suspicion of fraud, and we only give them the appearance of fraud when we confound them with history. And we, we do that many times. This is the case with all of the early histories. They were all anciently composed of, or if written, they were written in verses for the sake of correct retention by the memory. The most ancient of the ancients had nothing of nature or of real history. Real history was not the object of their writing. Their object of their writing was the mythos. Now, I want to read something else. I, I know this is a lot, but let me... This is Gerald Massey. Gerald Massey wrote... The first of this year, around 1900, 19, well actually he wrote, I think one work he did was around 1896, he did another work in 1897, and he did this particular work about his 80th birthday. And this is a very extensive work that he did on, on the, the light of Egypt. I want to read you something that he wrote. Let's see. Listen to this. On one line of its descent, the Jesus legend was brought on to Rome from Egypt by the mystery teachers, whom we term Egypto-Gnostics, and whose Jesus was no word made flesh in one historic form or personality, either at Nazareth or at Bethlehem, but was absolutely non-historic. You know, this kind of stuff can just continually go on. Alvin Boyd Kuhn again. This is one of my favorite authors. And uh, by the way, all of these men that I am reading from, you can do your own homework and your own research if you'd like. And you can see that these were men who lived integrous lives, men who had given their lives to research and to study, but men who had been rejected by modern Christianity because of the, the, the depth of of the research and the study that they brought to the table. So listen to this. Uh, this is Ivan Boyd Kuhn. In a work that, that we have presented the 
demonstrable conclusion of Gerald Massey's study that among ancient peoples, the localities, the names, the characters, the titles of kings, heroes, and others were all taken from... You ready? I'll read that again. Among the ancient peoples, the localities, that's the cities, the names, the characters, the titles of the kings, the heroes, and others were all taken from the original zodiac or astrological charts of the heavens and transplanted onto maps, earthly histories, personages of national renown. And so Paul even, he alludes to this. He says, do you, you do not know that the story of Abraham is an allegory? And if you go back and you can do some homework to see what is an allegory. It's a fabulous story. It's a mythos. It's not recording the history of a man and a woman. There was not a, an Abraham and Sarah. The story of Abraham and Sarah comes out of the story of Genesis. I can take Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and I can show you that it is the anal analogy of the anatomy of a baby growing in the womb of a woman. I mean, it's so obvious and so clear once you begin to break it down from the Hebrew text, you can begin to see that the Esh and the Esha, which we would call Adam and Eve, which was the male and the female, it was the masculine and the feminine, it was the Esh and the Esha that was told to marry and become one. It wasn't talking about an Adam and an Eve or a, quote, man and a woman. It was talking about that that was in the womb of creation, that that was in the womb of growth, the Esh and the Esha, the male and the female, the masculine and the feminine, the heaven and the earth, the spirit and the natural. It was referring to that always. The material's always been about make that one. That's the work that you have to do. In ancient wisdom, it was called the perennial philosophy. It was called the great work. It was the thing that you do yourself. Nobody can do it for you. We live in a society today where we're lazy. I better be good here. <laughs> we're lazy. We're undisciplined. We are, in America, we're eating ourselves to death with fast food. We're killing ourselves with drinks, the things that we ingest and put in our body. We're trying to offset it with drugs and pills, and we are not any the better. And it will never change in your life, and it will never change in my life until I decide to do it from within me. Nobody can do it for you. No one can do it for you. Only you can do it for yourself. And I realize that we have... We have issues that we need to face, that we need to address, that we need to get honest and serious about, and we need to do it in a way of compassion where we can love each other and stimulate each other to overcome those things that we face. Amen. So we, uh, he says, were all taken from the original zodiac or astrological charts of the heavens and transplanted to the mounts and the earthly histories and personages of national renown. History and geography were alike framed over the pattern shown in the mountain, the pattern of the heavens. This universal ancient custom is the key at once to all of the mythic religion of the past and the conclusive seal of the non-historical characters of the scriptural narrative. I, I, just, I get high on that stuff. <laughs> uh, that to me. And again, I would I would and not, and I'm not trying to take away from your concept or your idea of a historical character in the Bible. My, my admonition to you, my plea to you, my cry to you, my warning to you would be this. If so be that you have to have this historical character, pay attention to what the historical character represented and then replicate it in your life if at all possible. In other words, you implement it in flesh and bone and let it be your flesh and bone. 
so that if it's if it's necessary that you have to go through some disciplines or some changes or some transformation in your life, then do it. Damn it. Amen. <laughs> All right, let's go to this book right here. Let's go to the spiritual anatomy. Ah, uh, this is this is the spiritual anatomy of you, of human beings. And so there's so much beauty in this for you and me to extract and to get out of it. Okay? I know I I have people write me and call me, Lynn, don't say those words. People get mad and upset. I know it. I know it. I don't mean it to upset them. But they get upset. Uh, Genesis 2. Y'all help me. I'll try to quit doing that. I'm trying to quit. Well, I do like spice as long as you keep trying. I'm trying. Y'all have to forgive me. Y'all forgive me, don't you? Y'all forgive me. And, the, and well, I'm going to get to that. Just Maybe I'll get... I may not get to the ejaculation of God. I wanted to get past that because people can get into bumper mentality and not understand the beauty of creation. But that thing that you just brought out, that was phenomenal. That was phenomenal. And if we can understand that that ejaculation of that seed is in every female and that womb that gives birth to it is in every male. Men don't realize it, but they go through the same 28 cycle 28 day cycle that the women do simply because they do have a feminine aspect that is affected by the moon and it's moon energy and that's not wrong that's just it's just the way you're made that's the way that you create so you know Lynn what 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 you were addressing and what I was addressing when an emotional part of me came alive with the accident of my son is a lot like the logic and the emotion the male and the female Activating together, you become a much stronger, more powerful, more powerful person. <laughs> Without either or, you do not have the power. That's right. Lau could not have laid on his son and grown and brought life back into him without that feminine emotion that had to break and come out of him. Can you see that? You see, we, we have... I hear so much teaching about the ego. You've got to get rid of it. You cannot, you do not want to get rid of your ego. Your ego is one of the greatest gifts that God gave you. It's given to you to serve you, not you serve it. Our problem is we serve it. And we have to, we have to get that <coughs> in proper order. That's all. Just get it in proper order. You don't want to get rid of your ego. I'm telling you, you really don't. That's, that's that thing that gives you those, the ego is attached to your senses, all seven of your senses. Your see, smell, taste, touch, hear, your feeling and emotion, your feeling and emotion, which are synonymous, they're the same thing. But your intuitive nature and your experiential nature are two of those things that are intertwined on that pole of the caduceus that's wound up inside your very being. You are intuitive whether you know that you are or not. You are. So we want to cultivate all of those. We don't want to get rid of them. Our work is to cultivate who we are. And you've got to cultivate that. You have to work on it. You have to work with it. And so, here in Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, uh, you know, sometimes I would like to take, I, I'm not sure that I could because I get too, on too many sidetracks and too many rabbit trails, but I would like to take a time to exegete the first three chapters of Genesis just from verse 1 right on through the end of chapter 3 where that the child is released from the womb, I mean the garden, but it's released from the garden with these flaming cherubims. And we understand those flaming cherubims are that child's ability to do that divine think, thing, which is think, imagine, to use that imagination. And then he comes out, there are three different aspects of his being. Once he's out of that garden, there is the Cain, Abel, and Seth aspect of his being, which are the mind, the will, and the emotions, which you never want to have. And you'll see that, you'll see that repeated, because after you come out of Genesis chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, 6, 7, 
take, then you begin to find these stories about these phenomenal characters. They, those stories are not about people. They were not about an Enoch that lived 365 years. They were not about a Methuselah that lived 936 years. Those numbers all have to do with the things that are going on inside you. They weren't talking about a literal people living that long because they had some kind of special anointing you don't have. You will find that after those, four, those three, Cain, Seth, and Abel, they were the three boys that you know of as, as uh, Adam and Eve's children. And then the next one that you find in the picture of this story right here that comes on the scene is Noah. And guess what? Noah has three boys. Do you think that that's an accident? No, that's not an accident. Noah's three boys, Shem, who are they? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. What have we done to that but butchered that all to pieces? Again, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. I can extract their names from the Hebrew and I can show you mind, will, and emotion. And then you come right on through the story and then when you get out, after you get past Noah, you have uh, Terah. And who does, what does Terah? Has three boys, Abraham and his two brothers. What are they about? Who is Abraham about? He is about Abraham and Sarah, about that a, the Sarah from the throne room of God, the, the place where God is having the thunderstorm going on in your head, those phenomenal thoughts and ideas. So anyway... Where did we go to? Genesis 2? Genesis 2, 7. So what I want to do, and I'm trying my best to do it, is to show us that the greatest gift that we have, which is the soul, which the soul is, is dual in creation, dual in nature, but not divided. It's difficult for us to hear that. It's like God is dual in nature but not divided. God is both spiritual and material. He's both and. He's not either or. We try to decide, dissect or divide and so we've divided ourselves from ourselves and can't find <coughs> ourselves. And we're looking at ourselves in the mirror. It, it's so, but we are waking up. It says in verse 7, it says, The Lord God formed man, Yitzar, man of the Adam, of the dust of fodder, that word dust of fodder, light particles, particles of light. You're, light. you're made out of light. You're a light being. Uh, you know, there's, gosh, there's so much teaching going on now that, I, I mean, I, you know, you, you guys get on YouTube, I'm sure there's so much good stuff on there. The rainbow, you're a rainbow person. That's, that's just who you are. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Bill Donahue? It means dot com. If you're not familiar with Bill Donahue, you ought to get on Bill Donahue. It means dot com. Uh, he's doing the same thing that I'm doing. Uh, Santos Bonacci, uh, Savan, uh, golly, there, it, it's just a plethora of people that are on there that are phenomenal, phenomenal, and they've done their homework. So the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And there are words that are used in here in the Hebrew that uh, I would like to spend some time to work with th this evening. Let me just put these words up here in the Hebrew. Uh, 
is a phenomenal word or a phenomenal letter. Matter of fact, 50 sometimes is hid in 49. So when you see cases of 49, you remember the day of Pentecost was what? It was after the feast 7 times 7, 49. And then the next day. So this is, this is usually hid after the patterns of 49. It's like if you read the uh, if you read the lost scriptures or you read the Gnostic scriptures, you read the pro, promorphic protonia, you, you read the uh, Gospel of Thomas, you read a lot of these other scriptures in here, they will begin to talk about the seven sevens and the golden the golden value of those numbers, but really what they're coming to is the non, the Hebrew 50. And so when you see these, when you talk about the Nephilim, which you are introduced to in Genesis chapter 6, that they saw that the feminine aspect was created and that it, would, it had that potential and that ability to bring forth, they began to merge with it. And so when you, I'm not going to get with the Nephilim, but I do want to get with these these particular non-letters, these non-words right here. This particular word right here. This is called Nephesh. This is one that I would like to work with a little bit this evening, not a lot, but a little bit. This one right here is called the 